the picture taken at, uh, in the ruined cloisters of a 12th century Franciscan Abbey at Tivoli in West Cork in Ireland in 1997 when Patrick visited it there. And I have some very good memories of the time he spent in Ireland. I find it hard to be sure which aspect of the academic life Patrick enjoyed the best, research and scholarship or teaching. I think it was probably research. It's difficult because he was, too, he was so dedicated to and brilliant at, at both things. What I am sure about is that I have benefited greatly from his expertise and devotion to both. On checking, I found that we published more than 30 times together, more than I have actually remembered. And of course, many of these were with other people, many of you here. And for a reason which I will explain, he taught me much more than might be the norm for a postdoctoral position, or went as a postdoctoral position. It's exactly 44 years and four days today since I first met Patrick uh, on September the 9th, 1969. My wife, who was very new and shiny at the time, and I. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. He <laughs> <laughs> had flown to Canada where I was taking up teaching postdoctoral fellowship with Patrick at the University of Western Ontario as it was then known. The choice, by the way, was made by fate because when I finished my PhD, I blitzed a number of senior scientists in North America to get a postdoctoral position, and Patrick was the first to answer. Times were very different then, there was no internet, no easy way to immediately learn details or get a picture of someone important that you were about to meet. So I asked a colleague at University College Dublin where I had been as a graduate, an undergraduate postgraduate, and this colleague had worked with Patrick at Imperial when he was there in the faculty, and I said, how might I recognize him? Because Patrick had promised to meet us at the airport at London, Ontario. Look around the airport was replied for a Spanish man with a beard and a slightly worried expression on his face. And that would be Patrick. <laughs> I did, and I can honestly say that it worked perfectly. And so began what was be a beneficial and happy period in my life, a long uh, collaboration, which lasted many years after I returned to Ireland, and of course a treasure of friendship uh, that has lasted a lifetime. Patrick was very kind and thoughtful to us from the beginning. He had booked us into Hotel London for that night. And the next morning he arrived there to drive us to the apartment and we reserved in the graduate student accommodation. And he came complete with sleeping bags, foam mattresses, and all the other necessities that allowed us to start what was really a new life. I'm not sure how good Patrick's side of the team was. I had just emerged from a PhD during which my supervisor had suddenly and tragically passed away after one year. And I had finished with the insightful but fitful supervision from uh, a Professor Hans Wittberg in Germany. I think you'll see a, a Patrick's family tree scientifically later. And uh, Rickard had worked with my own supervisor with Carl Wagner. So he, had, he knew what I was doing. When I arrived at Western, no papers had been written. And uh, from the work that I'd done, and Patrick showed great forbearance, generosity, and patience in not only giving me time to write the papers, but also um, advising me and helping me to put them together and advise me on their content. But that started the academic work, I am deeply grateful. Patrick's continuous output over the years has left us a vast amount of detailed and exacting mm -hmm. scholarly research work covering many aspects of the chemistry of the solid state, as well, of course, as his two outstanding books. I'd like to think to be particularly interested in point effects in ionic crystals. That's, I think, because he and I interacted. But that would be a very restricted and narrow view of the contribution. He has made very extensive, incisive, and important contributions in our understanding of the nature and dynamics of point effects, but also in other areas, such as electronic effects, color centers, the reactivity of solids, and in particular, the solid state decomposition of crystals. In the later years of his career, he quickly recognized the advantages and power of and adapted uh, naturally enthusiastically to the then emerging techniques of atomistic computer simulation. And was particularly adept, I think, in matching complementary experimental and simulation studies to bring the best aspects of both to understanding the systems that he was studying. 
he became expert in the application of both lattice-static and molecular dynamics techniques to a variety of materials. I believe he had three great attributes that not only drove his work, but also enabled him to achieve such remarkable successes. They were first his insatiable curiosity, which meant that he was never satisfied to accept something as finished or complete, as long as there was some observation or effect, however apparently or important, that remained unexplained or not fully understood. Secondly, his encyclopedic knowledge of chemistry and of thermodynamics and of the solid state in particular, that I think almost instinctively seemed to tell him where to look for understanding. And thirdly, his great enthusiasm, determination, focus, and energy that drove him to strive to complete, insofar as it's possible, every investigation that he undertook. Nothing was too difficult and onerous, and every pathway was there to be explored. His enthusiasm was always contagious and youthful, and the effort he brought along several generations of younger colleagues with him. Patrick was enormously fair and honest. He was without doubt equally, and uh, perhaps more so, critical of his own work as he was as that of his colleagues. He never allowed his standards to be lowered. He never wavered, and that meant that it had to be done again to get it correctly or to be sure of the result that he did it again. All of this and more I discovered during the first few months after meeting him. Uh, it was, of course, in the search that we first interacted, and I've already said. To Richard, it's something that he was a, that he was a great man to work for. I didn't say easy, I, I said great. <laughs> and in fact, in those days, we young practitioners usually referred to Patrick as a great man. And if you said the great man, everybody knew him. It was Patrick. There was no small talk during his daily visit to the laboratory, and you may damn sure that you had some new results from the last time he visited to show him. He was very insistent. Before that, I don't think I'd ever heard about point effects on iron crystals, but that deficiency in my scientific knowledge was, was quickly and effectively erased. He convinced me that very quickly that as I did many things in life, uh, crystalline materials were boring when they were perfect. So I, I often just simply say, well, perfect to Patrick was boring. He was always looking for something more than that, something effective. Uh, we set out on what subsequently turned out to be a lengthy investigation of point effects in the silver halides. So Patrick equipped me with a conductivity rig that he had put together with loving care. Some extremely large sheets of brown paper, I've never seen larger sheets, that completely covered my desk. He scolded me for not having side room in my desk drawer, and then he set me to work. And uh, as there may be some of you who are not familiar with point effects, I just thought I'd put down uh, what, what it is that makes life interesting. First of all, uh, so that matter atoms on a molecule to move in solid materials, I apologize to those of you who <coughs> uh, it requires the presence of defects. If they're perfect, they don't move. All materials develop intrinsic defects as they're heated up from zero Kelvin. They gain an entropy from the disorder created, and that compensates for the enthalpy needed to form the defects. Very simple equation. And some fortunate solids are naturally that with lots of structural effects, and these are great movers, you know, great or whatever other sort of things you want to happen. And so here is some of the first work we did together. This is the <coughs> measured ionic conductivity of five crystals of silver chloride, what it looked like after about a year's work, or perhaps even more painstaking experiments. You have the typical intrinsic high temperature conductivity here. And you have the low temperature extrinsic conductivity, and the extrinsic conductivity, as those of you familiar with the field would know, increases with the level of dopamine that's in the crystal. Now, most of us might be satisfied with data like these, particularly since they analyze to give a consistent set of effect parameters for the material. And if I just move on, you can see this is how I'm going to put this in detail. But these are the parameters out here, and you just see they're a very consistent values, for example. <coughs> from a friendly effect formation, mobility, and so on. So most people might be happy with that. Uh, but it's a typical example of Patrick's, I would say, scientific curiosity, and also his nose, to which I've put really drawn attention. He noticed 
that the intrinsic line you may have known looked a bit fat or thick. It wasn't as, as, as it wasn't really as good as it should have been, and that there was perhaps more to be learned from that. So it was drawn on an even larger scale on these enormous sheets of draft paper, and uh, indeed revealed that there were some systematic differences between the crystals. This is a picture. You see, this is a very high temperature just on, on a bigger scale, and you see it is systematic. Because the data was really the differences are systematic in the intrinsic region. And of course, when we looked, we found an explanation in the analyzed data. The very large concentration of the intrinsic vacancies, which come from the Franco effect um, at high temperature, using a common ion effect, a common ion effect uh, through the equilibrium constant, forced the reformation of vacancy impurity pairs. These are usually dissociated at high temperatures, but if you have a lot, an awful, a very large concentration of intrinsic vacancy, it forces it backwards despite the negative value uh, of the energy. And so you decrease the conductivity of the heavily doped specimens. So whereas the specimens were, in the, the last graph I showed you, were most heavily and less heavily doped, in this they're in the opposite direction, most heavily and less heavily. So we were able to, to, to understand that, and as I say, it's just an example of the way that Patrick pushed and was, was so meticulous about getting every piece of information that he could. And what a great example that is of simple physical chemistry principles. I've often used it since to remind senior undergraduate students of what they learned or perhaps should have learned when they learned in that ionic equilibrium in their, in their first year lectures about the common ion effect. As some of you may know, Patrick went further later than I believe anyone else has in advancing our understanding of the behavior of point effects at high temperatures when crystals are near to the melting point. He also included the quasi harmonic approximation in calculations of the temperature dependence of their effect formation energies, and he coupled this with experimental measurements. The bioquin interactions were also, of course, taken into account, but I'm not going to go into all of this level of detail. Another example of great attention to detail and determination to gain fullest possible understanding of what was happening this time in terms of migration effects was his use of the quadrupolar uh, deformation of the silver line in the Hades simulation program to model the interstitial motion as well as the direct interstitial in the silver halides. As you also know, this very facile movement of, of silver was very important in the photographic. There was a lot of interest from Kodak at that time. And it had been impossible to definitively decide which were operative, which mechanisms were operative, from experimental conductivity and diffusion measurements and all uh, using the Einstein equations. So the, the ion was deformed, it became a rugby ball rather than a soccer ball, and so it went through these things, for example, the direct interstitials, which was possible much more easily than it had been. <coughs> um, Patrick's determination to collect the best possible data and then to analyze it as thoroughly as possible is exemplified in the next slide, which is taken from another early experiment that we did together. This is the thermoelectric power of a silver chloride crystal containing manganese, and, and it's at 327.8 uh, degrees centigrade. This is a deceptively, uh, perhaps deceptively, simple graph. What it measures is the voltage difference across the faces of the crystal that will be as a function of the temperature difference between the two faces. In order to get the graph, you have to get at least three temperature differences, hopefully reversed so that you can show them it's a straight line and it, it should have both looked in the origin, which this one does. I'm not going to say whether I think the best one does. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then you have to do this at a series of number of temperatures. You must have the same mean temperature all the time. And the crystal is about two millimeters thick, so you get that temperature difference across two millimeters, same mean temperature, do it again and reverse it. So you need to start this experiment when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> Having infinite patience is also somewhat of an advantage. But uh, it's it's so it's not easy to accomplish. But it was uh, it was the results were well worthwhile, showing at the time that the heat of transport of the mobile species were temporarily dependent and so correcting. Um, some early results in literature. On a less serious note, uh, Patrick played his part in nomenclature. 
not something that you would expect a hardworking scientist at that complex of, of research to do, to be interested in the literature. The, the, the UPAC guru is a hierarchy would be really proud of. At a time when there was much interest in the type of complex defect that could form in fluoride crystals, heavily doped with trivalent impurities, he devised a nomenclature which did exactly <coughs> what a good nomenclature should do. It should provide a unique name for a species to allow us to know exactly what we're talking about. And here is an example. This is, in fact, I have to read it, the 4 slash 1 slash 2 slash 4 sum 1. No, I haven't I've shown the effect. I think I've skipped a slide or left one out. Let me go back. Sorry. That's, that's a table saying how you do the nomenclature. And I reverse the perhaps. That's the, the four, one, two, whatever it is. Um, now, if you think I'm going to explain this nomenclature to you, you will be disappointed. <laughs> what I want to say is that it worked perfectly and it provided. Um, and an impossible man in Georgia, but those of us who used it, it was just great. I want to turn now to Patrick as a teacher. Uh, I've already mentioned that my time as Paul Stark, a fellow with Patrick, was somewhat out of the norm because I came from what I think most charitably be described as a pretty awkward current state. So he's the only postgraduate teacher and mentor that I have, really. Um, in that role, he did weigh over what might be expected and was extraordinarily generous and helpful. I've already referred to his critical reading assistance with the papers that were prepared on my thesis. I also attended his postgraduate course on solid state chemistry <coughs> at UWM. I think very fortunate for me, I was only required to audit the course. And if you're not sure what that means, it means that I didn't have to complete the exercises or do the problem that he set and be assessed for by him. I think that would probably be Lucas Faye. Without doubt, it was the best prepared and most professionally uh, presented course, I think, that I, that I ever attended. The subject matter presented was tremendously broad. It was nonetheless treated with great thoroughness. And all of this was accomplished through excellent lectures, wonderfully clear blackboard style, no overheads, no PowerPoint, and no notes. It was just tour de force to a huge area of advanced chemistry and physics science and physics. And the notes that I took of that have been a reference ever since and have served me well in my own teaching over the years. Uh, I know that this excellence in teaching by Patrick, both in content and presentation, was repeated in all the courses that he gave at Rester, and he always treated his contacts with the undergraduate students just as seriously and with the same concern as any other aspect of his work. He was a very dedicated teacher. He had a way of putting them and putting things that kept them and you in perspective. On one later occasion, after he sat through a talk that I gave somewhere, he said, well done, Gorge. You know I taught you everything that you know. But before I could begin to enjoy the compliment, he followed very closely, I hope with a twinkle in his eye, and you know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really can't be good in that. <laughs> I consider Patrick to have been a friend ever since I first met him, an essentially shy person. He was very quick and warm and come out to warm and come out of the shell. He enjoyed a good hearty laugh and really sparkled in company, both with colleagues and particularly I always felt with younger people. He was a wonderful host in his own home and frequently entertained his colleagues and co-workers. I also have a feeling that he allowed himself to enjoy life more fully as he got older. He was extraordinarily generous as a friend, totally loyal. He's always there if he needed help or advice. And he enjoyed and rejoiced and indeed insulted in the success of his friends. He and I had many great times together, and some of these are shared with many of you, and you will remember them also. His dedication to his scientific work, which was really an inspiration to his colleagues, meant that he was always ready to travel and to endure, often to endure the relative discomfort of staying in student accommodation if it meant making better progress with the problem. I remember one time we came out of nursing and across the road here. What's the name of the hall over there? Ramsey. Ra no, not Ramsey, this one here. Oh. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so we worked together in many places, such as the theoretical physics division at Harwell, 
the Kodak Research Centre in Rochester, the University of Kiev, University and Trinity College in Dublin, and we also work here at University College London, both in the old chemistry building and in the one where we are now. In this building, he and I were interviewed each year in the company of Richard, who was then a young, new young lecturer here, by the head of the department of the day, Professor Maximilian Nicolash, before we were let loose in his department. If he, if he had been given a penny for every time we crossed the road with a computer, which was over the road at that stage, to submit our job to collect our paper output, we would have been rich men at that stage. As well as coming to Ireland to work, he also came just to visit us on several occasions with his family and with his brother and sister. He was proud of his Irish ancestry on his mother's side, and my older colleagues in Dublin, who knew him before I did, always referred to him as Paddy Jim, which never passed. My wife's maiden name was McCarthy, and following his president and the nation, County the Manchester, we also gave our two children, Mary and Nessa McCarthy, as their third uh, Christian name. He came to West Cork, the ancestor of all the McCarthy's, on a number of occasions, most recently, I think, in 1997, and I hope they enjoyed it very much, even if I could never quite convert them to, 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 to liking boats or sea fish, but they did come. In the scientific research world, working with colleagues and friends inevitably means travel, and we all remember conferences around the world that were enlivened with Patrick's contribution and company. To mention but a few, I remember fondly a trip with him from Western Ontario, where I was at the time for some other reason, which I can't remember, to Salt Lake City. <laughs> Patrick was at the time wearing very dark spectacles with dark side pieces. Um, that he needed to protect his eyes because of damage and sensitivity caused by early experiments, which I think he did in the period. At Chicago Airport, a very kind young gentleman, airline agent, approached us as we waited to board and invited Patrick and Andy, of course, to board early if we wished with the families with young children. <laughs> Imagine my dismay when I heard Patrick say, No, thank you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with me. I'm perfectly capable of boarding normally. <laughs> He was always overly honest in his reactions, but was certainly the nearest that I ever came to telling him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> However, his reward came later, I have to say, uh, in flight, when we were both honest that we had been given really exceptional service by the stewardesses. We found out later that this was because, our, because of our beards. We were apparently mistaken for a couple of elders of the Mormon church <laughs> <laughs> returning back to Salt Lake City after <laughs> Patrick was also utterly honest with customs officials. So much so that I think he may have made them suspicious that he was hiding something. <laughs> On one occasion when we attended a conference in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, a group of us travelled by car again from London. I think yeah, was the yeah. reader who was with us at the time uh, was given a slightly used, i.e. secondhand, uh, black and decker uh, drill, electric drill by her brother. And Patrick became very concerned that this importation into Canada would be done legally and above board. And he gave, he gave us instructions on how business was to be carried out on the Canadian border when we got there. But we were sharing the drive in locally, and he was asleep in the back seat when we came through at Sarnia. It was about 1 30 in the morning. The custom official didn't ask any questions. I didn't get punished for it, I didn't get any answers. And, uh, <coughs> When Patrick woke up approaching here to London and heard that the drill had not been declared, I really thought first we were going to have to drive the 100 miles back. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we eventually persuaded him that the Royal Canadian Mountain Peace would not be nothing on the store for the second hand back in Beckham. <laughs> there are many more stories, and I will finally just mention one, what may have been Patrick's first serious encounter with Champagne. That was at the reception at the City Hall at Francois, Francois Benio's Euro Physical Topic Conference in Marseille in 1973. I think, apart from the science, this conference is remembered for two things a certain bulk trip, which I won't mention, and a reception. It was a really generous reception. One participant, or should I say, recipient, and like him, the rapid popping of champagne corks to the sound of machine gun. <laughs> there are some here today who shared the occasion. And I'm sure that, like me, you will remember Patrick's reaction and great enjoyment of the evening. I believe that an appropriate modern term might be awesome.
<laughs> I'm very grateful indeed I encountered Patrick James in my lifetime, and I'm sure that as many other people are. In my case, I know that the things I've learned from him about quantitative science, about scholarship, about standards, about persistence in the search for truth and understanding and about research were invaluable to me. Without this experience and his guidance, I would never have gone ahead, I think, with an academic career, and that's what I wanted to do. <clears throat> I'm deeply indebted to him, and indeed very fortunate to be on as a postdoctoral fellow, and I know that he inspired many other young scientists. Very simply, he was that kind of person, always willing to help the young set, to lead them and push them to their heights, and always doing good science in the process. He's a remarkable scientist, a true friend, a man of great compassion and life. Uh, outside of chemistry, he enjoyed hiking. And here he is walking with me in a wood near uh, Port Lake Sherry, uh, again taken in 1997. He had, of course, many other interests, to include camping, gardening, theatre, opera, orchestral music, art, reading, and he also made a good bread. He also devoted a great deal of energy after the former Soviet Union uh, disbanded and broke up to assisting universities in Poland and in Latvia uh, to rebuild and build up their research activities. I was lucky to be able to visit Patrick and Mary at their home in Toronto last year. Patrick was in great form. We went for a walk together in a wooded park near the apartment, just like we'd done in Cork some years before, and that is how I would remember him. A smiling, elegantly dressed man with a wonderful sharp intellect, a great interest in hard science, a sympathetic concern for all his friends and how they were doing, and a prodigious memory for the people, places, and events that had interested him during his life. Thinking of how curiosity, scientific curiosity, his determination to get the fullest possible understanding of systems and his success in doing so, I was reminded of another Patrick, a Patrick Johan, and uh, made Cork again who was accompanied Scott on the famous expedition to, the Antarctica, to Antarctica in the early years of the 20th century, with one of the very uh, celebrated people who came back from that. It was written of that particular Patrick, he always wanted to see the other side of the hill, and he saw. And for Patrick Taylor, I would add, and he always explained what he found there to his friends. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was a, a brilliant start. And now it's a great place to introduce some capos of the old scientists meeting, and who's known Patrick for many, many years. Oh, it's awesome. 